SpaceX Starship updates and one giant leap, a lunar starship. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. And as always, there has been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's take right off. Starship updates. And it's getting harder and harder to follow SpaceX's Starship progress in Boca Chica. Every single time SpaceX ramps up their development speed in Boca Chica, I think that this is it. They can't possibly go faster. And then they prove me wrong. Well done, SpaceX. This is the state at which SpaceX's Starship serial number 4 is at the construction site right now. Preparations work for a wet dress rehearsal and a static fire utilizing one Raptor engine have been going on for a few days now. The methane flare stack has been burning for a few days now as well. This means that there is liquid methane in the fuel farm already. If SpaceX fills up the tanks, they have to light the flare, so excess methane can be burnt off. This is a sure sign for propellant at the site. The last time we saw the flare was last year before the 150 meter hopper flight. This time propellant is needed for the static fire and soon after the 150 meter Starship hop we're all waiting for. Originally planned for last week, a few complications prevented SpaceX from proceeding as fast as they wanted to. First, strong winds, including a little sandstorm, prevented them from installing the Raptor engine. This has been done now and another milestone can be marked as finished. The Raptor engine in the picture is the one that will perform the static fire and then the 150 meter hop, if everything goes as planned. One interesting thing to note about the engine is that it has been mounted off-center. For those who do not know what this causes, here is a little illustration done by Casper Stanley from my team. It illustrates the difference perfectly. Here you can see the Raptor engine and how it's mounted relative to the center of mass, the balance point of Starship serial number 4. This point is a guess of course, but it shouldn't be too far off from where it actually is on the real Starship. Now if the engine is not dead center under the stack, it produces so-called asymmetric thrust. This has to be countered by the engine itself gimballing into the opposite direction to balance out the uneven thrust. This in return will cause a pretty awkward flight motion as the Starship will fly through the air slightly tilted. This should be possible as the Raptor can gimbal up to 15 degrees and later versions with three engines won't have this problem at all. It is not easily possible to mount one engine in the center as the whole lower bulkhead would have to be redesigned because it's thought to have three engines. This is not an easy task and not worth it for one test. While work on serial number 4 continues for a wet dress rehearsal and a static fire and we still don't know when exactly the static fire will occur, SpaceX has set new road closure dates for Highway 4, underlining their fast-paced progress. We have a new set of test dates for May 5th as the primary date and May 6th and 7th for backups. Musk has stated on Twitter that he expects the static fire to happen in the next couple of days, but it seems like he doesn't know an exact date yet either. So it is still a waiting game. One possible reason for conflicting operations preventing the tests could be a recent repair of Highway 4. It's been chip sealed. For those not living in the United States, where this is a very common method for rural roads, it is a quick and dirty way of improving a road. A layer of fine aggregate is put on top of the existing road mixed with tar or asphalt. This way potholes and cracks are sealed and the road is good to go for at least a while. It's quick but it doesn't last nearly as long as resurfacing the pavement. One more thing has changed at the construction site recently. Starhopper is changing his profession, pressing into my expertise. He's become a cameraman, anxiously awaiting static fire and 150 meter Starship hop to bring us the latest and greatest about space and science it seems. SpaceX has installed a full array of cameras on the hull facing the launch site and I am eager to see all the footage SpaceX will produce during the tests. Boca Chica gal, you have to step up the game, Hoppy wants to steal your hobby. So this is it from the launch site. The steadily growing ant's nest at the beach is buzzing and there are a few very exciting tests directly ahead. Now let's go to the construction site and see what's happened since the last episode. And it wouldn't be SpaceX if there was nothing to talk about. The nose cone presumably for serial number 5 has been de-stacked and moved out of the high bay again. It's unclear as of now why SpaceX has done it, but there seems to be something wrong with it. This wouldn't be anything new either. The nose cones apparently are more difficult to make than it seems or SpaceX is constantly reiterating the design. 
Either way, the nose cone most likely is going to see some changes in the coming days. One possible problem could be this dent, which looks rather nasty, but there is no official confirmation. Since Musk has already confirmed on Twitter that serial number 5 will definitely have a nose cone, these must be some last minute changes. On we go with the common dome segment for serial number 5. It's been moved inside the high bay. While moving the segment, Boca Chica Gal got some absolutely awesome shots of the integrated header tank inside the common dome. For those who do not know, these tanks are specially for the fuel needed to land the Starship. As the main tanks are mostly empty on descent and propellant and oxidizer would move around the empty tanks while the flip maneuver and the skydive are performed, the propellant for the descent needs to be stored in separate tanks, so the engines immediately get fuel when they need it. That is what these tanks are made for and SpaceX has found a pretty good design idea. Integrated into the domes, the tanks take up almost zero extra space as all the space around it can be used for methane and oxygen as well. Besides the thickness of the material, zero space is wasted this way. Serial number 5's thrust section is coming along quickly as well. With the new thrust dome integrated, it's almost ready for stacking now. This is one of the most important and most difficult to design parts on a Starship tank section and it's very likely that the serial number 5 thrust dome has again seen updates compared to serial number 4's engine section. Boca Chica Gal is doing an absolutely fantastic job with her updates provided through NASA Spaceflight and so we have the opportunity to do a direct comparison of the two bulkheads. On the left you see serial number 4's thrust dome. On the right in direct comparison is serial number 5's thrust dome. And we can instantly spot one difference. The stiffening girders on the outside still present on serial number 4's bottom bulkhead on integration into the thrust section are missing on serial number 5's thrust dome. As you can see by the marks on the metal though, they were present at some point. Maybe the recent pressure test on serial number 4 has shown SpaceX that these stiffeners are not really needed and so they removed them. This is prototyping work the SpaceX way. Build, test and iterate on the design. And once you're done, do a bit more of the same and always follow the golden rule, the best part is no part. There might even be more differences, but they are hard to spot from these two pictures. On we go with the new building. It recently received a door. And what a door it is. A massive thing with two large pistons to open and close it. In its open state, it looks like it's also acting as a roof. It's not clear why SpaceX went for this design, but it certainly does look good and provides an entrance for rather large parts. Maybe another indicator for it being the new ring manufacturing facility. And there's a large window integrated in it as well, letting some much needed light into an otherwise windowless building. Concrete pouring has been going on in front of the large tents, making the construction site a more and more dirt-free environment. It's not known yet what the new pad will be used for, but we'll see in the coming days. A testimony for SpaceX's extremely fast progress is my quickly growing list of videos about Starship development. If you have questions that need answering, it's definitely worth looking into the large library I've acquired over time. While you're at it, don't forget to like and give the subscribe button a good clicking. This helps me to make more content and it shows the YouTube algorithm that you appreciate my work. Thank you. So this is it for Boca Chica. As always, there will be lightning fast progress there and if you want to get updates in between the episodes, it's worth following me on Twitter too. And if you need a dose of SpaceX and space updates in general on the weekends, it's also definitely worth checking out my friend Marcus House. Broadcasting straight out of Tasmania every Saturday from the other side of the world, he does an absolutely fantastic job. There are often things he talks about that I don't and vice versa. Links in the description. One giant leap, a lunar starship. And on we go with news about the SpaceX Starship program. At some point I will be able to integrate this into my Starship updates, but for now it's still a paper dragon and a separate news topic. NASA has chosen three partners for moon landers and the Artemis program and one of them is SpaceX. This is news that's very important but didn't make it into the last episode. Sometimes these media releases are just barely out of the release window. But the good thing is that this actually gave me some time to research on this topic and dive into more details. So NASA has announced three partners for their Artemis moon missions. More precise, NASA wants external private companies to build three different solutions for lunar landers. 
The companies chosen are Blue Origin with a three-stage system partly also built by Lockheed Martin providing the reusable ascent vehicle. Northrop Grumman, the transfer vehicle and Draper will provide the descent guidance and avionics. So there are multiple companies involved in this deal and they are taking the lion's share of 579 million US dollars. Next up we have Dynetics with a two-stage vehicle. It's a very different design providing a habitat for a longer mission with direct and close access to the lunar surface due to the low cabin design. They will receive 253 million US dollars for their project, placing them in the middle of the funding pool. Last but certainly not least we have SpaceX and will have to concentrate on their idea a bit more. They will receive 135 million US dollars for a one stage approach. And they're calling it the Lunar Starship. That's right, contrary to all sorts of concerns about starships not being able to land on the lunar surface due to powerful Raptor engine exhaust gases throwing lunar regolith into the moon's orbit, SpaceX seems to have solved the problem. So this is SpaceX's design study at the moment. It looks similar to an Earth-based starship, but if you look closer, there are quite a few differences. And these differences come due to the fact that this starship is not supposed to return back to our home world. It will be flying from Earth to space and then stay there. Built to only land on the moon, it does a few things very differently. For example, it has a white coating and no shiny metal glare. This most likely is due to the fact that SpaceX chose to not coat the Earth-based starships to preserve the reflectivity a stainless steel outer hull has. This helps the Starship to reflect heat away from the hull. On the moon though, you can use a different approach. Especially if you want to stay for longer, you need to keep a cool head, or in this case, Starship. The day side of the moon gets quite hot and a Starship cannot rotate while sitting on the surface. So by applying a white coat to the hull, it will make it much easier for SpaceX to provide the proper cooling for our astronauts' heads. On we go with those strange black ovals on the hull. They could easily be confused with windows, similar to those on the Crew Dragon capsules. A recently released render by SpaceX though shows some very distinct engine exhausts coming out of those holes. While two engine nozzles are still reddish from recent use, they are turned off at this stage of descent. So against all the talks that moon landing with a heavy starship and a powerful Raptor engine wouldn't be possible, SpaceX seems to have circumvented the whole argument by just raising the ascent descent engines further up. This would have been a very interesting side topic for my interview with Dr. Robert Zubrin. Casper Stanley has made an absolutely awesome animation for today's episode showing a lunar descent with a brand new starship design to be utilized by NASA. Here you can see a full descent and what it will look like when NASA astronauts arrive on the moon. Well, almost. As the animation had to be done by today, the ascend and descend engines are not firing. That will come in the next version. The new leg design in this animation is particularly interesting as well as it's another one of those changes we can see in the renders released by SpaceX. Away from the current Starship concept of flip out legs, the lunar Starship will have legs integrated into the hull. This design might well change again in the future, but it's the latest official update from SpaceX. Also interesting are the two long black lines on the side of the Starship. They are directly connected to the crew and cargo exit. Since the payload section of a Starship is high above the ground when landed, SpaceX now seems to be committed to a crane system guided by rails on the outside of the hull. This way, any sort of cargo that fits through the hatch can easily be transferred to the ground and since starships have a lot of payload capacity, a lot of cargo will have to be lowered to the lunar surface. This is a very effective way to accomplish the goal. The recent announcement of a lunar starship specialized in this particular task is another indicator for SpaceX wanting to make the starship design as versatile as possible. For example, the recently published Starship Payload Guide, analyzed by me in episode 82, gave a first real indicator for SpaceX going with a modular approach. Different Starships accomplishing different tasks. If SpaceX goes through with this design approach even further, we might end up seeing a three module design. A booster, a Starship propulsion section and a fairing section. In theory, the two Starship components could even be connected with a universal connector. Need a tanker? Just use the Earth-based propulsion section and a tanker fairing. Need a cargo delivery to space? Go with the same propulsion section and a cargo fairing. Want to land something on the moon? Use the lunar propulsion section and the fairing. 
Want a Starship only for space? Go with yet another propulsion section and maybe this time with an asteroid miner in the fairing. Options are almost unlimited and SpaceX could constantly develop other sections for different tasks. SpaceX keeps surprising with great ideas. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It? What's wrong with serial number 5's nose cone and do you think that the lunar starship is a valid design? As always, tell me in the comments. And here we are again at the end of the episode and at a very important part of it if it comes to the show. This is my YouTube member and Patreon shoutout. I give this shout out every time and I make sure to do so as the help these people provide to me and the team is absolutely invaluable. In fact, while I was writing the script for today's episode, there were people watching me, giving me corrections and helping with ideas. These people are my patrons and YouTube members. They enable me and my team to give you these updates twice a week and they form the heart of the community. So show your love for them in the comments and maybe even consider becoming one yourself. And as on every single episode, there are new members on the team. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to G. Michael Scheuren, Zenef Rodriguez, City028 and many others. You rock! And what you see here on the side is my team of researchers, web admins, animators and helpers of all sorts. If you're interested in helping the cause and you think there's something you could contribute, become a patron and dive right into an awesome community bringing you What About It twice a week. Thank you team, without you this journey wouldn't be the same. Thank you for watching this episode of What About It and now would be the appropriate time to hit the like button, subscribe and don't forget to hit the bell button to actually receive a notification when I do my uploads. It's a version of support that doesn't cost a penny and it does help me to produce more and better content. And if you do want to spend your money, consider becoming a patron and get insights into the production of What About It and chat with me on the Discord. Or you could buy yourself a new shirt on our merchandise store and look like me. There are plenty original designs available in good quality for a low price made by a space nerd for other space nerds. It all helps me to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. Now let's go to the look. So let's dive right in. Oh. <laughs> I love it. As it is a. 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 Design idea. <laughs> yes. Go to Boca Chica.